All right. So thank you, everyone. Um, Paul Lavadera, I'm PGY3. So happy to present the first of our social EM series. So my only disclosure is that I am on the social EM lecture series committee. So this uh, topic is near and dear to my heart. In addition, I believe that a broader social awareness of who our patients are and from what experiences they come from create a more well-informed and compassionate physician and therefore a more just medical system. So I'm hoping at least one learning point from today kind of resonates with you and influences how you practice uh, medicine and engage with patients. So today I'd like to present on trauma-informed care and its utmost importance in the field of EM and traumatology. So trauma-informed care is a promising model for organizational change in health, behavioral health, and other settings that promote resiliency in both staff and patients. Um, this model understands and considers the pervasive nature of trauma and adverse childhood experiences and promotes environments of healing and recovery rather than practices that may inadvertently re-traumatize patients. So trauma-informed care is a framework and it aims to prevent re-traumatization in healthcare and promotes resil resiliency in both patients and clinicians. And it's based on six principles, safety, trustworthiness and transparency, choice, empowerment and voice, peer support and collaboration, and respect for cultural, historical and gender issues. And so all of these are um, influencing your way of how you speak to patients, how you kind of uh, walk into a patient's room and what you think about when you're talking with patients. So first off, you have to kind of define trauma. So the Coalition for trauma, National Trauma Research, uh, it defines trauma as traumatic injuries that are from vehicular collisions, fall from heights, gunshot wounds and burns. However, however, if healthcare providers are to break down the structural barriers that negatively impact and promote the under-resourcing and marginalization of populations and communities, trauma has to be kind of thought of in a much more broader and more multi-layered definition. So you can consider the definition by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, which is an event, series of events or set of circumstances that is experienced by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening that has lasting adverse uh, effects on the in individual's functioning of mental, physical, social, emotional, or spiritual well-being. And so this kind of encompasses a variety of different traumas on the different layers. So first you have your individual trauma. So events, series of events or circumstances, like I was saying, but also the interpersonal trauma. So adverse childhood uh, experiences, child mistreatment, domestic and sexual violence, human trafficking. And then finally, you have your collective trauma, which is that cultural, historical, social and political and structural traumas. So like racism, bias, stigma, oppression, genocide that impact, impact in individuals and communities across generations. So what I like to focus on is the adverse childhood experiences. So according to the CDC, adverse childhood experiences or ACEs are potentially traumatic events that occur in childhood, as well as the conditions in the child's environment that can undermine their sense of safety and stability. And from 95 to 97, the CDC and ACE pioneer, Dr. Vincent Felitti, at Kaiser Permanente conducted the first ACE study. It asked more than 17,000 adults about childhood experiences, and 70% of them were college-educated white people with well-paying jobs, and each was asked about 10 types of ACEs. So the original ACEs studied uh, focused on adversities in the home like abuse, physical, emotional, and sexual, neglect, physical and emotional, and other household ch uh, challenges like mental illness, an incarcerated relative, a mother treated violently, substance abuse, or divorce. Um, as research on ACEs has grown though, so is our thinking about how to best measure ACEs in research studies. 
So, so scholars now agree that child uh, adversity includes other experiences. I've kind of listed them over here to kind of expand what it means to have an ACE. Um, so for example, exposure to racism, discrimination, stigma, minority stress or historical trauma is another kind of expanded area of research that's now uh, being considered as an enhanced ACE. So back to that study, nearly two thirds of participants in the original study noted um, to have more, uh, sorry, um, at least one ACE and more than one in five noted three or more. More alarmingly, the studies show that a higher uh, ACE score, the worse their health outcomes tended to be. So the correlation between childhood trauma and poor health outcomes has been confirmed now by more than 70 other studies. Um, these risky behaviors include the following. Um, and the physical and mental health co outcomes correlated with ACEs are also included here. And so the studies have found over and over again that there is this correlation between adverse childhood experiences and these behaviors and uh, health. So the stress response associated with uh, adverse childhood experiences and trauma is understood as both psychological and physiologic. So when the body's fight or flight or adrenergic response is activated, our stress hormones, including epi and cortisol are released. And when the stressful response is removed, individuals return to homeostasis and the stress response uh, subsides. However, for people living in chronic stress, it can become very difficult to return to homeostasis. And the experience of living with chronic, chronic stress and a constant low level activation of adrenergic system creates changes in the brain and how you learn responses and creates altered reactions to stress in the future. The toxic stress response has been linked to these poor health outcomes and an increased incidence in psychiatric and substance use uh, disorders and decreased immune responses. And then this ACE pyramid, uh, it kind of depicts the unproven but theorized progression from conception to death of how ACEs influence a person's health and ability to function. So ACEs themselves can disrupt a patient's development with immediate and lasting consequences. And then an insufficient or mal maladaptive brain grows um, Growth gives rise to social, emotional, and cognitive dysfunction. And then to cope with that trauma, a person self-soothes -soothe, by engaging in unhealthy or risky behaviors. So those behaviors increase your health risk and increase your risk of disability and social problems. And that accumulates and becomes chronic. So um, according to data collected from 144,000 adults across 25 uh, states between 2015 and 2017, showed that 61% of those surveyed had at least one type of ACE, while 16% experienced four or more ACEs. And these statistics are very sobering. So if you remember, collective trauma is that kind of structural trauma, like racism, bias, and stigma, um, So and how they impact across generations. So with that in mind, there are groups that are more likely to experience ACEs. And if you examine the demographics that are shown here, our patients in central Brooklyn are at higher risk for experiencing ACEs than at higher rates in other communities. Um, so the collective impacts of trauma can be traced in ACEs data as well. So Merrick uh, et al found that women, Native American and black people and the category other race or ethnic group were more likely to experience four or more ACEs than males and whites. Higher ACE scores were reported by Black, Latinx, and LGBTQ communities with the highest ACEs in multiracial and bisexual respondents. To further drive home this point, the Child and Adolescent Health Measurement Initiative in 2020 found that certain racial and ethnic groups experience more ACEs than others. So the effects of ACEs, as I've been saying, can be passed down from generation uh, to the next, if children don't have protective buffers like positive childhood experiences um, or a caring adult in their lives. Also, when families experience historical and systemic racism or living in poverty for generations, the effects of ACEs can add up over time. And in a relatively new field of study, epigenetics seeks to identify how experiences and stress shapes DNA and how it's transcribed over time. So the downstream clinical effects of epigenetic changes are apparent in a number of clinical settings, particularly in behavioral health. 
So we can create positive childhood experiences. The primary prevention of ACEs or stopping ACEs before they start would benefit the economy and relieve pressures on healthcare systems. The science of ACEs also reveals opportunities to improve the lives of all lives of children and adults. So strengthening communities, promoting uh, community mentorship programs, supporting um, like interventions at the time of the childhood uh, trauma presenting in the ER room can alter the course of that child's life and their health outcomes in the future. So it's vital that we do not act as if people with high ACE scores are damaged goods. You know, research shows that people respond differently to different types of stress. So for one person, enduring childhood abuse or divorce might be a trauma that badly damages their health. And for another, it might just be a hardship that they overcome with little lasting damage. What we can do is mitigate the toxic stress with nurturing supportive experiences. So for some survivors of trauma, the experience in the ED may be re-traumatizing or trigger past experiences. So survivors of trauma may experience emotional dysregulation, like trouble controlling their strong emotions, which we see all the time, hypervigilance or increased threat perception and reactivity. And the close uh, interplay between the executive functioning and emotional regulation may impact both the patient and the care, care, uh, care team's navigation of the encounter. So similarly, hypervigilance could make the often hectic environment of the ED, as well as interventional procedures harder to, to tolerate. So I'd like to introduce a few cases to kind of illustrate trauma-informed care in practice. So we have a patient and on your EPIC board, it says 29 year old male and their chief complaint is abdominal pain. So the patient's name is Logan. The chief complaint is abdominal pain for three days with nausea and vomiting. Uh, the HPI, so you have a diffuse abdominal pain with multiple episodes of nausea and vomiting. Patients unable to tolerate PO reports quitting cannabis a few months ago. And then on chart review, the last visit was a similar presentation. Reports uh, the patient is a frequent flyer with intermittent cannabis use and hyperemesis. Their temperature is 99.5, heart rate 100, blood pressure is okay, and the saturations are good. Patients in acute distress, crying from pain and doubled over with diffuse abdominal tenderness and garden. So on the uh, residence assessment plan, it's likely cannabinoid hyperemesis, but the difference does include uh, a bunch of other things. So treat with antiemetics, analgesia, order blood work, and a CT if there's no improvement. Um, however, the ER visit kind of goes into a drastically different um, kind of way because the patient's actually trans male. However, the last IPN note reports 29 year old male instead of the correct identification. So no discussion is had about the patient's reproductive or sexual organs during the initial history taking. The patient is asked multiple times about cannabis use despite saying he last used many months ago. However, the previous note says patient still intermittently using cannabis. One nurse refuses to use him and uh, he and him pronouns and is heard saying, well, she doesn't have a penis, so that makes her a woman. The resident realizes his mistake, but presents the attending be, uh, before asking the question, uh, asking more questions to the patients, which it's so busy and they just want to get uh, move on. The attending uses a she pronoun, is politely corrected by the resident, and the attending says she, he, it, I don't know, it's so confusing, I just can't deal with an earshot of the patient. Patient symptoms are improving but um, not resolved. So he wants to go home instead of having to deal with the stress, stressful environment of the ER and wait for the CT scan. The physician comes back to the patient, starts asking about reproductive organs, but the patient's so upset about the nurse, just wants to leave. The heart rate is elevated at 120, blood pressure is now 100 over 60. The patient makes a big fuss. Um, the provider team is unsure about capacity and the patient syncopizes during the, the commotion. A CT scan is finally acquired and there's evidence of PID on the scan. Um, looking back, there were many instances of systemic and personal mistakes that led to the patient's poor experience. Instead of presenting to the case to the attending, um, the president could have gone back into the room, asked some more thorough history, um, sexual history, and offered to a pelvic exam to complete the physical exam. And a diagnosis of PID could have been made uh, more clear, more sooner, and could have been discussed uh, with the patient about treatment options and whatnot. 
But how did patient, how did Logan's previous experiences prior to this day culminate into this ER visit? And what may have happened in this patient's past that contributed to this poor outcome uh, for the patient? So consider the following. So uh, someone's uh, a female assigned at birth and in 2007, uh, they identify as gay. They tell their parents, but they don't, the parents don't support the patient or believe the patient. In 2009, the parents go through a pretty big divorce and a lengthy uh, legal process. In 2010, the patient identifies as trans male, chats with the PCP about uh, gender transition services. However, the PCP does not believe in hormone replacement therapy, diagnoses gender dysphoria, and refers to a psychiatrist. In 2012, the patient finally finds a supportive pediatric endocrinologist, begins tra uh, gender transition, adopts the name Logan and he and him pronouns. At the same time, gender, uh, Logan is exploring his uh, sexuality and some drug use. The parents refuse to accept pa the patient's gender and only uses she and her pronouns. In 2013, patient uh, Logan is unable to receive a high school diploma despite being two months from graduation and moves to the city. While in the city, Logan holds a job for about six months on average, relatively stable housing, living paycheck to paycheck, intermittently uh, living in shelters, and is smoking cannabis on a daily basis. He uh, gets top masculinizing surgery done, and around this time, uh, Logan has multiple ER visits for abdominal pain without a diagnosis. GI scopes him, doesn't find anything, and Logan's diagnosed with cannabinoid hyperemesis and generalized anxiety disorder. Um, and then in 2022, the ER visit occurs. Um, and after all these experiences, um, he kind of brings all of that to that ER visit. Um, and, you know, he's bringing all these previous traumas, subpar medical experiences and understanding these potential experiences from a trauma informed care approach may help you better empathize and understand his story. So this isn't to say that you need to know exactly what is happening in your patient or for example, in Logan's past, but that, or that his experiences destine him to have this horrible ER visit. Um, what this is supposed to illustrate is that approaching the patient with a trauma-informed lens could help you help the provider and you um, to develop a rapport with the patient built on trust, transparency, and agency. And in doing so, this can empower the patient to open up and communicate a full and complete medical history and help the team come to a correct diagnosis with respect for the patient's unique identity. Um, and so kind of illustrating that this patient has experienced, you know, physical neglect, emotional neglect, and a divorce in, in, the, in the past, contributing to three adverse childhood experiences. Um, another patient. So on the EPIC board, you have a 26-year-old male, chief complaint is STI check. Patient's name is Malcolm, identifies as gender uh, non-conforming, coming with rectal pain. Uh, HPI, there's redness and tenderness on the anus. It feels like I'm driving a hot spike into my butt and twisting. On uh, chart review, three vi previous visits for gonorrhea chlamydia, no primary care doctor, never referred to STI clinic, and uses condoms intermittently. Vitals are okay. Uh, he's standing, uh, cannot sit due to pain, perianal vesicular lesions. And the assessment plan is likely orthopox or monkeypox, less likely HSV. Um, unfortunately, um, and this is a quote that like literally was said the other day. Um, well, this patient was just asking for it. He's clearly very promiscuous. So consider the following. The patient in 2003 was um, actually the, the patient's brother was sexually assaulted by a neighbor in 2005 that brother then sexually assaulted the patient, as is very common with sexual assault and the cyclical nature of it. In 2010, um, the patient goes to therapy in college and the therapist inadvertently makes the patient feel it was their fault and the patient uh, has to stop going to therapy. Uh, and in 2016, 2020, uh, the patient has many visits uh, to the ER after uh, multiple sex partners within the queer community and then presents in 2020 with monkeypox. So try to imagine seeing this patient in 2021 during their third visit for gonorrhea and chlamydia. Instead of ridiculing the patient for their promiscuity and just treating with ceftriaxone and doxy, perhaps the, the physician could have um, 
gotten the patient to a PCP or referred the patient to a community cell sexual health clinic or talk to them about pre-exposure prophylaxis like Truvada or Discovery. Avoiding harmful rhetoric and practicing risk reduction will reach this patient more than guilt and unrealistic commands of just don't have sex. So kind of just reiterating the point that this patient had sexual trauma in their past, which may could be contributing to their, um, their behaviors as, as an adult. Um, so just kind of harmful rhetoric. Why can't you just stop having sex? Monkeypox is a gay disease and monkeypox is a sexually transmitted infection. Risk reduction would be monkeypox is spread through skin to skin contact, particularly intimate body contact common in sex. During this monkeypox outbreak, reducing the number of sex partners or intimate partners can reduce your risk of contracting the virus. Or if you are a person at risk for contra contracting monkey virus uh, pox, you may sign up for a monkeypox vaccine free of charge through this website. And these are all things that you can tell a patient rather than you're so promiscuous, you have to stop having sex, you're gonna get monkeypox. And so this is a more realistic approach as physicians if you're, if you're kind of taking a trauma-informed care and understanding that people have past experiences and behaviors um, rather than telling them an unrealistic goal. So kind of just a st uh, statistic, one out of five uh, college students from the transgender, queer, or not non-conforming community have been sexually assaulted compared to non-transgender, queer, non-conforming males at 4%. In addition to that, sexual assault uh, survivors will have different responses. And a recent uh, study in health psychology showed that rape survivors that had negative uh, interactions with police, medical professionals, and the legal system post-assault and reported experiencing blame tended to increase their sexual risk behaviors. So multiple uh, partners without contraception, tendency to use alcohol and other drugs when engaging in sex as compared to their counterparts. So, you know, it reminds me of the one time I had a, a SART case and I had the police officer um, in the room with me as I was doing the history thinking, okay, I don't wanna make the patient have to do, do it multiple times. And the police kept saying over and over again, like, wait, so did this happen first or did this happen first? Did you do this or like, I can't, I don't understand the, the, the chronology of what's going on. I just sat there and I'm like, why, if you understood that people who are traumatized can't always tell you exactly what happened and it's not so clear cut and just watching the patient as she had to go through that was just, it was just really horrible. And that's something I never want any of us to have to put a, a patient through. So as we close, kind of wrapping up, what can we do as ER physicians? So um, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration summarizes their approach to trauma-informed care as the four R's, where providers seek to, number one, realize how trauma affects the individuals and communities they serve in their practice. So kind of understanding your community and their interactions with the healthcare system and specifically for our patients, their interactions with Kings County and downstate. Number two, recognizing the symptoms of trauma in their patients. So trauma may come in the form of anxiety, lack of eye contact, hesitancy to participate in the healthcare encounter. It can also come in less obvious ways like poor adherence with the medical care or pain out of proportion to the injury or examination. As trauma-informed providers, we understand that these reactions are the result of previous trauma and not something personal to that patient uh, with uh, the healthcare system. Um, kind of responding to patients in a trauma-informed way. So this, this means building trust and mutual respect during a trauma activation, making eye contact and explaining to the patient what exactly is about to happen to them. Um, you may ask consent throughout an examination about asking relatively invasive questions, consent to perform a certain physical examination, setting expectations, explaining your process and reasoning for what you're doing, and updating your patients on the results of their, of their diagnostics, explaining and asking input on the plan of care. While much of this seems intuitive, these practices have been shown to be lacking in many healthcare interactions, particularly on busy shifts when we've all got kind of one goal in mind, which is disposition, or just trying to get through the day. Resisting re-traumatization of patients. So displaying body language and posture that's welcoming, non-aggressive and respectful, allowing time and space and patience for those who have been traumatized as they retell and relive a traumatic experience. So understanding that you may be in that 
room with the SART case for 30 minutes and understanding that that is what's going to be helpful for that patient and make a difference in that patient's life and consent for physical examinations, as I already said. And then finally, adding my own R, refer. So knowing your limitations of what you can do as a medical doctor and knowing that you have uh, time limited, referring to social work and having them talk to the patient and giving that, that, that time to the patient, maybe if you don't have the time. Um, community peers um, to, or referring to their PMD or a psychiatrist. A trauma-informed care model helps us to move away from what's wrong with you to what happened to you and how has that affected, or how has that what happened affected you? So, you know, we have a lot of resources at Kings County. We have Kavi, which, whose mission is to prevent and eliminate interpersonal violence from the lives of young people through advocacy, peer leadership, community mobilization, and social justice. Um, we have peer counselors that are ex an extension away or a phone call away. I love calling Mr. King at whatever hour, he'll always pick up his phone and let you know who's on shift if, he, if he's not there. And making a social work consult for um, who people who may, be, who may benefit from speaking to someone from Kavi. So putting a social work consult and just putting in Kavi as, or putting it in as your trauma order set in CCT, you know, consulting trauma right away and consulting social work right away um, and putting in Kavi. Um, we also have gender and sexuality resources here in the community. So we had the HEAT program, as the interns were aware of from in, uh, orientation. They're on the fourth floor at UHB. Uh, that's for adolescents. And then you have the STAR program, which came out of the 80s and 90s during, um, during the HIV AIDS epidemic. Um, and is now, you know, kind of providing all kinds of care, but still has specialty resources for HIV. And they're in the suite J on the first floor at uh, UHB. Um, we do have the SCI clinic at King's, which is on the fourth floor as a walk-in. We have uh, flyers and fast track. And then if all of those aren't good for the patient or the patient could benefit from something else in the community, Colin Lord is, a, is an amazing resource based in Manhattan, but they do have a Brooklyn extension on Flatbush. Um, so I'm no stranger to the pessimism brought on by moral injury we experience in the hospital or the oscillating feelings of burnout throughout residency during a global pandemic. But I try to keep my core principles of compassion, awareness, and kindness at the forefront of my mind in order to combat those negative feelings. It may be e uh, easy to feel defeatist about ACEs since we are often seeing patients after whatever ACEs have occurred both uh, immediately after or 20, 30, 40 years after. But it's important to know that a traumatic childhood doesn't preclude uh, a healthy life for each individual. Keeping my patient's individual experiences in mind, walking into my patient's room with my you know, schmise and remembering that you have the potential to create a positive impact and memorial, uh, memorable experience with the patient in front of you to heal the patient's medical conditions and psychology is something I try to, I try to keep in mind. So combating bias, quick judgment and frustrations with compassion and trauma-informed care and understanding is something that I encourage you all to try. And if focusing on the patient in front of you isn't cutting it, or if they're in full bone crisis mode and super aggressive, deal with the situation, find a quiet spot to decompress, just zoom out. <laughs> Remember you're just a speck of dust in a vast sea of dust particles just swarming through the universal cosmos and find me or another senior or peer to chat with because we're all here for you as we navigate both direct and indirect exposure to traumatic events. So, thank you.